uh, to our new series of politics, law, and economics lectures. We have with us tonight uh, our uh, very distinguished speaker, Victor Clark, who is going to talk about fair trade. But he will be introduced properly um, shortly by our new colleague, uh, Dr. Gordon Brady, who has joined us as a research, senior research fellow uh, for this year. Uh, I just want to say a few words before we start about the series, just to advertise it really. Uh, we have um, Senator Phil Graham speaking here in September. The details are circulated to you on the list, on the uh, email list and so on. But that's actually September the 18th. Uh, we also have a politics, law and economics colloquium spread over three dates, which is really looking at captive na na nations of one kind or another, and that's in November. Um, there are details to be filled in, but that will cover um, Russia, Venezuela, and Cuba for sure. Uh, we have one uh, Cuban human rights speaker, uh, Rosa Maria Pea. Uh, I'm told that's going to get the local Cuban community very excited. So we we'll look forward to that. Uh, and we're moving towards um, another public policy discussion rather as we have one tonight on fair trade. At the end of the series, we will have one on public housing. And Howard um, Hassock, who writes regularly in the Wall Street Journal, will uh, discuss new approaches to um, supporting housing and relieving housing poverty, um, more market-based approaches, not those that have failed to work with uh, uh, public housing. Uh, and so you know, just uh, you look out for the uh, emails as they come through, and. Um, enjoy the series as it goes on. Again, welcome. And let me introduce uh, Dr. Gordon Brady, who will in turn introduce Dr. Carr properly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Demez and the uh, Florida Southern uh, College for having me here this year. Uh, as you know, Dr. Demez is head of the Center for Free Enterprise. And it's a great, a great honor to be part of such a, a very impressive gathering of people interested in the topics of free enterprise. So, uh, Dr. Clare is a, a very distinguished, uh, I think, theologian is the best, uh, perhaps the best uh, description. All of our lives, we've heard about concern for the poor. It's a common theme which uh, runs through the scripture and the history of the church. Fair trade coffee, that's something that we haven't heard about until just the last few years. How Fair Is Your Cup of Joe is the name of his latest book. This book raises the economic and moral issues concerning the logic and the reasoning which underlies the fair trade movement. And he argues that despite all of its good intentions, free trade might not actually benefit the intended folks that we are, are, are aiming at. And this is especially true for developing countries, where the plight of the poor is, is the direst and the needs are the greatest. And we would hope that any kind of policy innovation or any kind of movement to um, somehow help these people would indeed do that. Uh, Dr. Clarence, uh, book is available on Kindle, it's in hard copy, and also in electronic media. And I think it should be a very stimulating uh, presentation. I look forward to it. Thank you very much for, for being here. Thanks very much for that wonderful introduction. before as a theologian, so are we okay? Yeah, I just turned it down a little bit, you're too loud. Um. <coughs> <Okay>. Better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, testing, uh. testing, one, two, three. 
It reminds me of an old joke. There's this joke, um, big talk, professional conference, maybe it's economists, I don't know. But anyway, at this big conference, um, the main keynote speaker is speaking in one of the huge ballrooms. So it's one of these where you open up the divided doors, there are like 300, 500 people in the room. And the talk is going well, but somebody way in the back can't hear very well because the microphone isn't working as well as it ought to or the, or the amplification isn't working as well as it ought to. So um, somebody way in the back says, stands up and says, we can't hear you back here. And somebody closer to the front says, turns around and says, well, I can hear him great, and I'd be happy to trade places with you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, again, thanks so much for in inviting me to join you tonight. I'm really excited to be here. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what I learned about fair trade in the 10 years or so that I've been working on it. When I first started researching and writing about fair trade coffee, I didn't know a lot about it, and part of it was because it was a relatively new area. So for those of you who are professors, those of you who are aspiring scholars, a couple of, uh, couple of tips. One is, if you start a new research line, start a new research line that's relatively young. Because in a summer, or in a summer and a fall, you can read literally everything that's been published in that area, and immediately you'll know just as much as everybody else who's already been working in that field. So that was true with Fair Trade Coffee for me. When I started to read about it, about 10 years or so ago now, it was a relatively small research area, and I spent a summer or so reading everything that there was in EconLit, and I became as knowledgeable as anybody else. Another tip is, once you're knowledgeable in that new area, then find a collaborator and co-author who's already done real research, in this case, field research, in that area. And so very quickly, you have somebody with professional expertise because they've done the scholarly work, and you know everything that there is to know as far as the existing research is concerned. When I started to write the book, you know, I had lots of friends who were working very hard at marketing fair trade coffee to our local community. So I'll tell you in particular about one friend of mine. Um, I'll call her Nancy tonight. Nancy is salt and light. She's Christ in our midst in ways that I can only dream of being myself. I love Nancy. Nancy is doing exactly what Nancy should be doing as a human being on this planet. And Nancy was responsible for single-handedly getting the fair trade coffee concession going in my local church community. So it was a mainline Lutheran church, ELCA, and between services, not only did we have coffee hour, you know what coffee we had. We had fair trade coffee. And then if you enjoyed that coffee, you could go see Nancy. And Nancy would be happy to sell you Equal Exchange certified coffee through the partnership that Equal Exchange has with Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, ELCA. So as I read about fair trade, and as I learned about the fair trade model, and I learned about what it tried to accomplish and whether or not it was in fact delivering on what it promises, every time that I sat down to write, it was almost like I had Nancy's photograph next to my computer. No, I didn't actually have Nancy's photograph next to my computer. I had my wife's. But I was always thinking about Nancy because regardless of where the research led, I wanted to speak the truth. I wanted to speak the truth in love, and I wanted to make sure that wherever the research trail led, that I communicated that honestly, but also in a way that would be engaging so that people would be able to consider more carefully how to care for others that where their where their hearts really are. So um, in the Christian tradition, we're told that when we serve the poor, we're also serving our masters. So that's a lot of responsibility. But that's a lot of pressure. If you're going to care for the poor and by extension the master, then you shouldn't do it in some haphazard slapdash way. You should do it in a way that's ultimately effective, serving the poor that you're trying to address. So let me tell you the story about fair trade coffee. So my remarks tonight are based on the Fair Trade International model. This is the Fair Trade labeling system that's used throughout the world. And when you see this label, you know that there's been one international certifying agency that's guaranteed that when you purchase this coffee at Walmart, at Kroger, wherever you do your shopping, when you see the seal, you're given several assurances. And the assurances are these. Everybody, every coffee grower who produced this coffee was paid at least the local minimum wage. No child labor was used in the production of the coffee. Everything was grown in an environmentally sustainable way. So for example, none of the coffee was grown in protected rainforest. And everybody produces the coffee using the 
international labor organization rules for hiring and for labor practices. Another guarantee that you get, though, in addition is you get a guarantee that the coffee growers are receiving at least a minimum price per pound for the coffee that, we're producing, that they're producing and selling that has this label. Currently, that minimum price per pound for a pound of Arabica beans, those are the really good ones, and we'll talk about those more in a second. Currently, the guaranteed minimum price is about $1.60 per pound. And in addition, for every single pound that's sold, whether that $1.60 minimum price is in effect or not, everybody receives at least 20 cents per pound, and they refer to that as the social premium. So whether coffee prices are high or coffee prices are low, everybody receives at least the guaranteed minimum price. And when the minimum price isn't binding because the world price of coffee is high, everybody gets the world price, and they still get that additional 20 cents per pound. So one way you can think of the Fair Trade International label is you can think of it as an international umbrella organization. So if you go to Canada and you buy Fair Trade Canada, it says Fair Trade Canada, but it has that logo. If you go to Poland and you go through a McDonald's drive through and you buy a cup of coffee in Poland, you look at the side of your cup and at the bottom, what label do you see? That label, that blue and green arm reaching upward. So the reason for this international agency that oversees all of the certification of fair trade coffee is to make sure that all of the coffee is grown in a way that's compliant. So not only does Fair Trade International license the use of the label, they also do the inspections. So they scour the globe, they visit all of the fair trade coffee growers who are participating in the fair trade network, and they double check. They make sure that it's not grown in a rainforest that there aren't children who are being used in the production of that coffee, that everybody is being paid at, most, at least a local minimum wage. So when you're in the store, you can't see the people at the other end of the supply chain. Well, you can't meet them, you can't know them, but what you do know is when you see that label, you're helping the poor. So here's a little thought experiment I like to do. Suppose that you're in your local coffee shop or your local grocery store, and there's a coffee there. You haven't seen it before. Looks really interesting. You check it out on your smartphone, and the reviews are really great. And you ask some of your friends whether they know about it or not. And all the feedback that you get is that, th that this is a delicious coffee, and you consider the price, and it seems like a great value for you. So you're all ready to buy the coffee. You pick it up. You start to put it in your cart. And then what do you notice? Oh, you notice another bag near it that has the fair trade label on it. Well, what do you do now? Well, you do a little more homework, check on your smartphone, look at reviews online, you ask for friends, and your friends also tell you, this is also a great coffee. Well, now, what do you do? One way to think of this is, it's now become a moral decision for you. Because you could buy the relatively low-priced, delicious coffee you were thinking about buying in the first place, or you could buy the one that has a slightly higher price, but seems like it maybe also is just as good and just as delicious as that first coffee. So for you, this second coffee has become good person coffee. Now, I don't know about you, but I like to think about myself as a good person, and I love it when you think of me as a good person. So if I'm standing there in the grocery store, and I want to do the right thing, right? I know about my friend Nancy, I know what Fair Trade Coffee intends to do, I want to help the poor, it's an important thing to do, I have to decide now whether I buy the coffee that seems delicious and fits my budget best, or whether I buy the one that's certified as a good person coffee. Now again, I like to sleep peacefully at night, so I might very well pay extra money to buy the good person coffee because I want to think of myself as a good person. Another thing I might do though is I might buy the good person coffee and make sure that when a small group from my church comes to my house <laughs> and I serve them coffee, I make sure that they see that it's the fair trade certified coffee. Or I go into class with my equal exchange coffee mug. And so my students think, oh, Clark, he's a good guy. He cares. He wants to help the poor. And he doesn't mind spending extra money in order to do it. This can pay off for me in lots of ways. More manageable class, maybe better under the semester evaluations, maybe even higher ratings on ratemyprofessors.com. <laughs> But, you know, it's not even that simple. It's even more complicated. Because once you notice the Fair Trade Certified Coffee, then next to it there's 100% organic coffee. <laughs> and next to it there's Rainforest Certified Bird Friendly Coffee. <laughs> well, what is a caring person to do now? Do you triple your daily coffee consumption so you feel less deadly at night? 
while you're awake because you can't sleep because of a <laughs> coffee drunk? Yeah, I don't know what the answer is there. So what I want to do first is put on my hat as an economist and ask some basic questions. The first one is, what is it about coffee? Why is coffee the very first of the certified fair trade commodities? And why does it require a special solution? Right, if I think about other goods and services in the marketplace, most businesses, they stand or fall based on how well they serve their customers and how well they price their product and how well they contain costs and the development and investment and research that they do. But in the case of the coffee market, champions of fair trade coffee say, well, you know, coffee's just a different sort of product. So let's look at the coffee market and examine some of these claims. To begin with, though, it's a little helpful to know some basic things about coffee. There are essentially two, variety of bean, two varieties of beans, Arabica beans and Robusta beans. Have you ever had a cup of coffee that was so good you'll never forget it? Anybody? Oh, some people have. You want to tell me about that cup of coffee? Do you remember it? It was in Washington State, and it was raining outside. It was a lovely restaurant, and the cup said things go better with coffee. Yeah. <laughs> and, and was the coffee itself delicious, or was it the experience, or was it both? It was delicious. So this was probably a cup grown brewed with 100% Arabica beans. Yeah, and it was the drip thing. Oh, the pour over? Yeah, very, very good. <laughs> so these 100% Arabica bean coffees, they are delicious. Arabica beans are highly prized because they have a mellow flavor. But here's the thing about Arabica beans. You can't grow them just anywhere. They're suited to small-scale production at high elevations. So these are the coffees that have made nations like Brazil and Colombia famous. They grow these high-quality Arabica beans. And most of the time, when you buy a 100% Arabica bean coffee, it says so right on the package because they want you to know that you've got the good beans. It's also true that once you plant a new Arabica plant, you can't harvest it immediately. It takes three to five years for a newly planted Arabica plant to be ready for the harvest. So you can take the coffee chairs. The other variety of coffee is the Robusta. I'll ask the parallel question. Have you ever, ever had a coffee, cup of coffee that was so awful? <laughs> You'll never forget it. <laughs> I've seen lots of nods. If that coffee was probably brewed with mostly, if not 100% Robusta beans. Robusta beans got very popular in America during international military conflicts overseas because those were the beans that we used first to make instant copies that were used by the GIs and the rescues. Robusta beans are robust. They're very resistant to, to things like disease and fungus in ways that Arabicas aren't. The Robustas you can also grow on large scale plantations and the elevation doesn't matter as much as it does for the Arabica beans. It's also true that the Robustas they grow and are ready for the harvest much sooner than Arabica plants are, normally two to three years. So these beans, they're very popular. They became especially popular once we started to make instant coffees. And I've done a little homework just to check. If you go to Dollar Tree tonight and you find a $1 package of coffee, if you flip it over, of course, it doesn't say 100% robustness because that's not a message that you want to send. But it probably says that all the beans are from Vietnam. And if the beans are from Vietnam, which is actually one of the world's largest coffee producing nations today, and we'll talk about it more in a second, those beans from Vietnam are probably robusta beans. So they have a bitter taste, they have more caffeine, and the plant matures more quickly than the Arabica does. So this is a map that gives you a sense of what kinds of beans you can grow across the globe. So if you look at the dark green shaded areas, so West Africa, Southeast Asia, those are mainly robustas. If you look at the yellow shaded regions, those are the high elevation, high quality coffee nations that we talked about. Those are the Arabicas. And then you see nations like Brazil produce a mix. They produce both the Arabicas and the robustas, and that's the lighter shaded. Those are the lighter shaded regions. Now notice something. You can't grow coffee at just any old latitude. Agreed? In fact, if you could, we would probably have protectionist policies against Ohio coffee growers to make sure that we keep that coffee out from other countries. But you can't grow significant coffee and high quality coffees much outside of what's referred to as the bean belt, and I'll show you the map of that in a second. So what's really interesting to think about here is not only is it true that most coffees need to be grown because of environmental considerations at a fairly narrow latitude range, 
Those also happen to be the same latitudes where the bottom billion remained. Right, it was a really exciting time to be alive in my lifetime. A billion people have moved out of extreme global poverty. That works out to about 137,000 people per day, every single day. Right, that's thrilling news. But there's still about one million people who today remain in extreme poverty and they happen to live within this fairly narrow latitude range. So people who argue that we need a solution for coffee because it's a unique market, they essentially make two arguments about fair trade that are based on price. One is that they say that coffee prices, if you leave them alone, they're just too volatile. They move around a lot, and if you're a poor coffee grower, that's a lot of uncertainty. It's really difficult to grow your coffee crop and make plans if you don't know for sure what coffee price you'll be able to get for your crop at the end of the growing season. The other argument that people make is you're never going to live a middle class lifestyle growing coffee. Coffee prices are just too low. So let's take a look at the data. So this is a time series diagram, and you see two lines in the diagram. The blue line is the blue line is the fair trade price. The orange line is the spot price for Class C Arabica beans on the New York Coffee Exchange. So are the champions right? First of all, do coffee prices move around a lot? And remember, the orange line is the market price. Yeah, coffee prices move around a lot. Right? They spiked a couple of times in the 1990s. They spiked again around 2010. They spiked again around 2013. And as a researcher of coffee bean prices, I can tell you that when coffee bean prices spike, it's normally for one of four reasons. Bad weather in South America. Bad weather in South America. <laughs> a third possibility is bad weather in South America. And then a final reason that coffee prices might spike is, yeah, you guessed it, bad weather in South America. So when coffee prices spike, it's simply because there's a drought, or there's a frost, or there's a flood, and as a consequence, a whole lot of that crop that would have gone into the harvest that year is destroyed, which is terrible if you're wiped out. But it's really great if you already had coffee plants that are ready for the harvest that year and you didn't lose them to the bad weather in South America. Now, as an economist, I know that when prices spike like this, they do two things. Prices do two things. They ration out the supply that's currently available. And over time, if those prices remain high, they induce a supply response. They create an incentive for people who currently aren't growing coffee to grow more coffee as a consequence. So look at the way the price of those Arabica coffees bottomed out around 2000, 2001, 2002. You see that? After those two big spikes in the 1990s, the price bottoms out. What happened? That's the period during which Vietnam became a major coffee player. At the beginning of the 1990s, Vietnam wasn't anywhere in any top 10 or any top 15 list of coffee growing countries. But after those spikes in the 1990s, People shifted away from what they were currently doing in Vietnam, began to grow a lot more coffee, and those coffee beans were primarily robusta beans. So low-cost alternatives, and those robustas could be substituted at least partially for Arabicas and some blended coffees. Um, so the other line is the fair trade coffee guaranteed minimum price. So you can spot places where the minimum price has been binding, and it shifted upward over time, so there's where the minimum price was in the early 1990s. There's where the minimum price was at the end of the 90s and the beginning of 2000s. And then we've raised it to the current level that I mentioned earlier. And so you can see that it kicked in briefly here. So if you look at the diagram, you can see that when the world price of coffee rises above the guaranteed minimum price per pound, the coffee growers always get the world price. They always get whatever the market price is. It's only when the world price of these Arabica coffees falls below the guaranteed minimum that the coffee growers receive the guaranteed minimum price that's made available through Fair Trade International. Regardless of what happens to the world price, every single year, everybody gets the 20 cents per pound social premium. Everybody always gets that. So if we can model this for a second. I'm an economist, so I've got one supply demand diagram, so enjoy this. Uh, yeah, supply demand diagram, currently the price of coffee is really low, it's down to P0, and students of economics in the room, how have I drawn the supply and demand curves here? Oh, I've drawn them both so that they are, who said that? <laughs> <laughs> Should be a fun. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Now, I've drawn them so they are both price inelastic. Now, what does this mean? It means that the demand curve obeys the law of demand. 
That means that as the price fluctuates, people do increase or decrease their quantity demanded in response. But if you're like me and you've got a three cup a day habit, even if the price of coffee doubles, it's not like I reduce significantly my daily coffee consumption. I might shift to some less expensive coffees, but for the most part, what am I going to do? I'm going to maintain that habit. And so I've drawn the curve so that it obeys the law of demand. As the price rises, quantity demand decreases, but it doesn't decrease that much. And then the supply curve, I've also drawn so that it's price inelastic. What does this mean? It means that coffee growers, as the price rises, they would like to make a lot more coffee available. But in the time frame we're talking about, it's difficult for them to do that. Why is that? How many years does it take a new robusta plant to be ready? Two to three. How many years does it take a really good, mellow flavored arabica bean to be ready for the harvest? Three to five. So the supply is price inelastic also. So let's do a thought, thought experiment here. I don't know, bad weather in South America. We'll shift that supply curve. Boom, we'll shift it to the left, destroying a lot of the existing crop. And what happens to the spot price of these arabica coffees? It goes up, way up. So if you've ever wanted to try to explain to your friends why it is that some commodity prices move around so much, so quickly, it's almost always that inelastic demand is combined with inelastic supply. So this is true for gasoline prices. We have our current cars, we have our current commutes, and same thing is true on the refining side. Fixed refining capacity, fixed number of oil wells, and so little tiny movements in either curve can mean big, big fluctuations in those market prices. So again, why is the supply price inelastic? Not only does it take two to five years for a new plant to be ready for the harvest, not just anybody happens to be living in a latitude range where you can produce additional coffees. So as long as our coffee production is constrained to the bean belt, then it's difficult for coffee growers to respond in a short amount of time and grow significantly more coffee. So the champions of fair trade coffee, they're right. Coffee prices are low. And they've been pretty much at the same level for the last 25 years or so. And they're also correct that coffee prices move around a lot. They're extremely volatile. So one thing that's helpful to ask then is, how did fair trade coffee get started in the first place? So just a little short history here. Initially, at the beginning of the 1900s, there was one major global coffee producing nation, and that nation was Brazil. And they supplied so much coffee to the global market that the government of Brazil manipulated the coffee price. So because they had some monopoly power, they were able to get even higher prices, economic rents. And the way that they did that is they made less than the entire crop available that season. And because they made less available, they didn't put everything they produced into the market, they could charge a premium price. And the price rose more quickly than the rate at which they were decreasing the quantity they supplied. Government of Brazil was so serious about this that in one year, 1937, the government of Brazil set fire to 17 million bags of coffee. And that year only about 30% or so of the Brazilian coffee crop, because it was great that year, only about 30% of the coffee crop, in fact, made it to the market. Well, Colombia saw what its Latin American neighbor Brazil was doing. And Colombia can also grow high quality Arabica coffees. They have high elevations. Land was suited for it. But Colombia, rather than trying to manipulate the market, Colombia turned to skillful marketing. Does anybody recognize this gentleman? Juan Valdez. So this is the Cafe de Colombia Mark. And when I was a kid growing up watching television in the United States, if you saw Juan Valdez and his trusty burro, you knew this, this was deli delicious, mountain-grown, high-quality, 100% Arabica, Colombian coffee. And you know that it was delicious, and it was just as good as those coffees that they were producing in Brazil. Well, other nations began to enter the market also. So first there was Brazil, then there was Colombia, then other nations began to enter, nations in Africa. Lots of coffee growers were moving into the coffee market in the 40s and the 1950s. And this set the stage for something called the International Coffee Agreement. This was a deal that was set up in a testy conference brokered by the United Nations, and it brought together coffee consuming nations with coffee producing nations. And what it did is it set a quota, an annual limit on how much coffee each currently coffee producing nation 
was permitted to bring into the market that year. So it was a way to how do monopolies work? They were spraying the quantities of blood and they charge more. So this was a concerted effort to create a cartel. All of the coffee growing nations nationally, internationally, they work together to produce less and charge more. So the quotas were set relative to what coffee growers have been producing in recent years. And why did nations like the United States go along with this? Well, remember, it was 1962. Foreign policy in the United States, politicians, we were really concerned about Marxist threats in Latin America. And so the diplomatically pleasing thing to do was to sign off on this coffee agreement and agree that, yeah, we'll be buyers of coffee in a monopoly where we created artificial scarcity and we created this quota agreement. But by the late 1980s, Soviet experiment was waning. United States government, other Western governments were less concerned about Marxist threats in Latin America. And so the international coffee agreement collapsed. So this was really challenging if you were a Latin American coffee producer. And all of a sudden now you had to compete in the market with lots of nations who could produce lots of high quality coffees. So that's this set the stage for the modern fair trade movement. It happened simultaneously in two nations. Um, in the Netherlands, there was a solidarity organization, international charity, that worked with some entrepreneurial coffee growers in the Mexican state of Oaxaca. And they were just looking for new customers, new people to buy their coffee. <coughs> So they worked with this aid agency, and they launched the first fair trade label ever. And it was launched in the Netherlands, and it was called the Max Havelaar label. And Max Havelaar was a famous fictional character in a Dutch novel. So today, fair trade in the Netherlands is still referred to as Max Havelaar, and they still use the same label that you see there that all of the coffee growing nations that have fair trade labeling also use. At about the same time, while the United States was not as concerned about some political threats in Latin America, one at the end of the 1980s was still very worrisome to the United States. That was in the nation of Nicaragua. So in that period, the United States government had a full trade embargo on the nation of Nicaragua. Well, there were some compassionate coffee importers living in Boston who exploited a trade loophole and began to import coffee from Nicaragua into the United States. And this was the beginning of the biggest and best known Fair Trade Coffee Company in the United States, Equal Exchange. So you may recognize the label there at the top. Coffee roasters in Boston who bring in coffee, they purchase it under the guaranteed terms of the Fair Trade Coffee Agreement, and they make it available to caring people like you and like me. So I've given you a lot of information, but what we haven't addressed is, well, what about this guy? This is the coffee grower that we're never going to meet, that we're never going to know, we're never going to learn his name. And what are we doing? We are generously, with our hearts in the right place, paying a price premium for coffee because we think all of the way at the other end of the supply chain, maybe, just maybe, we're making a difference in the life of that individual who's trying to provide for himself and his family. So why do we do it? Well, I was surprised when I did my research about fair trade coffee to learn that there's a huge marketing literature about fair trade coffee. And in fact, you can do experiments on university campuses at the student coffee concession, and you can change the relative price of fair trade label coffee to other coffees and see just how much people are willing to pay extra for fair trade coffee because it's the right thing to do. Well, one way to think about fair trade coffee is that when I buy a pound of fair trade coffee, it's bundled maybe with another good. So bundling is a concept in marketing. If you offer two prices individually, then maybe consumers will behave one way, but if you bundle them together for a single price, then maybe they'll change their behavior accordingly. So you can think of fair trade coffee as bundling. Maybe when I buy a delicious bag of certified fair trade coffee, I get some charity or justice along with that, which makes the coffee even more delicious. But since I don't really know fair trade coffee growers, I really have to trust the marketing part of equal exchange to try to persuade me that I really am making a difference when I purchase these coffees. Another possibility is that one of the things we're making an investment is, isn't for, maybe it's ourselves. And I alluded to this a little bit earlier. So economists refer to this concept as social capital. So again, I like to think of myself as a good person, but I like you to think of me as a good person also. And if you see that I'm drinking fair trade coffee, then you'll think, oh, a car's a good guy. Um, this is a t-shirt that my 
young as son bought for me a couple of years ago. <laughs> it's an American apparel shirt, so the fit is pretty good. It's black, so it looks serious. It's got this thick white silk, silk screening on it, outline of Africa, and then what does it say? Proceeds from this shirt benefit my image. <laughs> so when you wear this around town, people either say your shirt is hilarious, or they look at your shirt and they go, what? <laughs> Um, another way to think about fair trade coffee is it can operate as a form of price discrimination. Now, if you're a student of economics, you know what price discrimination is. Charging different people at different prices for the same good or service. We voluntarily do this all the time. We go to the movies, we turn up voluntarily on Friday and Saturday night at 7.30 and 9.30 and we pay the highest possible price to see the latest motion picture. But you know, if you're a college professor, you go Tuesday, 10 a.m. for that early bird special, see the movie for $6. It's fantastic. Well, why do people turn up voluntarily to pay the highest price possible? Well, it's all about opportunity cost, right? Most people have jobs. They have other things that they need to be doing at 10 a.m. on a Tuesday. So if you turn up on Friday and Saturday night, day night, you're saying that I really need to be here right now because I can't really be here at other times. So we do this with airfares. We do this with hotel room rates. We do all kinds of price discrimination. We give senior citizens discount prices on cups of coffee. We can think of fair trade coffee as a form of price discrimination. And in his book, The Undercover Economist, the journalist and author Tim Harford, who writes for the Financial Times and also wrote the book, The Undercover Economist, Harford tells about his experience with Costa coffee. You know, Costa is UK chain, sort of like Starbucks. You see it all over the world. You see it in Beijing, you see it everywhere. Tim Harford loves cappuccino. And he noticed that the price differential at Costa between certified fair trade cappuccino and not certified fair trade cappuccino was about 25 cents per cup. Now, Harvard knows that it doesn't take a lot of coffee to make one cup of cappuccino. And he also knows what the price differential is, what the coffee growers are getting for the certified fair trade coffees. So the math here just didn't add up. Harvard realized he was paying way more at the coffee counter to the baristas at Costa that couldn't really be justified based on how much it was actually getting at the coffee growers who were getting $1.60 a pound or $1.40 a pound. So Harvard's a reporter, he's a journalist, he contacted Costa's corporate offices and he said, so what gives? I just don't understand this, can you explain how this works? Costa's response was that they couldn't justify the price differential and they ended up selling both the certified and non-certified fair trade coffees at the same price. So one way to think about this then is, when you walked in and said, hi, I'd like to pay extra, I'd like to pay, pay 25 cents more for that certified fair trade coffee, you were sending Costa Coffee two different messages. The first one was, I'm a good person, and I think fair trade coffee should be supported. The other message that was much more interesting to the company officials at Costa was, I don't mind paying extra for pretty much the same cup of cappuccino as long as you give me a really good reason to do so. So what I'll do in the conclusion is I'll tell you some of the basic facts about fair trade and whether it's working or not working that maybe you can't learn from the marketing from fair trade coffee directly. So a couple of talking points here. The first one is, you may not know this, but in order to join the Fair Trade Coffee Network, you have to pony up significant funds at the front end. So if you're a cooperative of small coffee growers in a poor coffee growing nation, the initial application for you to join the Fair Trade Network and get this guaranteed minimum price is about $600. Now this seems counterintuitive to me. If we have desperately poor coffee growers, and we want to generously give them extra money for the coffee, it seems counterintuitive at the beginning to demand $600 as part of the application fee. Another thing you may not know is that just because you've applied to join the network doesn't necessarily mean that you'll be approved. And even once you're approved, there may not be a buyer who's willing to buy your coffee under the terms of the Fair Trade Coffee Agreement. In fact, in one notorious case, there was a Mexican cooperative of coffee growers that searched for eight years once they'd been approved as a fair trade coffee grower to get someone else on the other side of the market, like Equal Exchange, who was willing to buy their coffee at the guaranteed minimum price under the terms of fair trade. 
The third thing that you may not know is that your unfair copy may have been grown by a certified fair trade copy grower. Even people who are champions of the fair trade copy movement and think that it's great, they'll confess openly that in a typical year, only about 35% or so of the copies that are grown by certified fair trade copy growers are actually purchased under the terms of the fair trade copy agreement. Why? Because there simply isn't enough demand from caring copy consumers to buy all of the copy that they're producing in that particular year. So the other 65% or so, it gets dumped into the conventional copy market. So if you had a cup of coffee this morning and you didn't know whether it was a certified fair trade or not, well, chances are that it was grown by a fair trade copy grower, but wasn't certified because it was part of the 65%, not the 35%. There are also some strange, interesting distributional effects that happen as a consequence of fair trade copy. Um, remember that companies like Equal Exchange, they are companies. They do need to be viable. They're owned by their members, their cooperatives. But they need to make sure that they contain costs and that they produce high quality copies at prices that are attractive to their customers. So in the case of equal exchange, or in the fair trade movement more broadly, take a nation like Peru. Peru is located pretty close to the United States already. Its GDP per person per year, its annual income per, per, per person is about $5,000. And in one recent year, about 25% of all fair trade copies came from Peru. So this is great, right? You have relatively low income coffee growers in Peru, and about 25% of the fair trade copies worldwide came from Peru. Tanzania also makes great coffee. If you've had Tanzania, Tanzanian pea berry, you know this. Tanzania grows great coffee. But Tanzania is poor. I said the Peru per capita GDP is about $5,000. Tanzania, the per person annual income is about $500. So if you're really trying to help the poorest copy growers, you should buy all your fair trade copy from Tanzania and not buy it from those Peruvian copy growers, right? But in that same year, of all of the fair trade copies that were grown globally, only about 4% came from Tanzania. So this is really interesting, right? We're helping the poor but we're not helping the poorest of the poor when we buy copies that are located nearby in places like Peru where the transit costs are relatively low and where you have lots of people already growing lots of high quality copies, normally on plantations that have been owned uh, in the same family for years. And then finally, the results, they're not really that inspiring. And now that fair trade has been around for nearly 30 years, we have lots of good empirical evidence now that tells us what is and isn't, isn't happening along the supply chain. The most stunning study that I've seen is referred to as the Hohenheim study, and you can Google that later if you want to check it out. It was a natural experiment. Researchers looked at coffee growers in the same location, some of whom joined the Fair Trade Coffee Network, some of whom did not, some of whom they didn't. And at the end of 10 years, the coffee growers who weren't in the Fair Trade Coffee Network are actually doing better than their Fair Trade counterparts. Why is this? Here's the main reason. I told you that it costs $600 to join the network. That's not where the money stops. Once you've been approved to join the Fair Trade Coffee Network, the first inspection that your cooperative of poor coffee growers has to pay for, it falls between about $1,700 and about $4,100. Right, so you paid $600 to join the network, but then, if the Fair Trade International is going to come in and monitor and make sure you're compliant, the brokers themselves pay those monitoring and compliance fees, which again can be quite significant. And after the first year, annual certification, recertification ranges between about $1,400 a year and about $3,000 per year. So when you ask yourself, so how could it be that Fair Trade copy growers are actually worse off after 10 years or so? In many cases, it's because the investment in those fees the application fee and the monitoring and compliance fees, they just couldn't pursue that investment. So what's my suggestion to you tonight? It's to drink the coffee you like. That's my suggestion to you. If you want to do the right thing, drink the coffee you like. Drink the coffee that you like, that fits your budget best, and drink that coffee. And then if you want to do something to be charitable and to help the coffee growers at the other end of the supply chain, then every time that you drink a cup of coffee, put away a nickel or a dime or a quarter and save that 
and eventually over time, at the end of the month, at the end of the year, take that accumulated change and give it to NGOs that you know are working more directly with coffee growers in terms of developing the things that lead to lasting gains in terms of economic growth and prosperity. And we economists, we know what they are, tools to do the job, math, English, other educational skills, and finally things like clean, clean drinking water and basic nutrition. Have you ever been so hungry you just couldn't think straight? That's the reality for lots of people living below the extreme global poverty line in the United States. So Fair Trade Coffee, as far as it goes, is a charity. But it's just not a very efficient charity. If you took the money that you're paying extra for, I would argue, overpriced coffee, instead save that and then gave it to invest more directly in individual human beings, I think the lasting impact would be more exciting and we could all celebrate that lasting impact. Thank you very much. Time for questions, and uh, uh, Dr. Miles will wander around and armed with a microphone and a raw high whip. So now it's a very good evening to get those questions in. Okay, who wants, uh, who wants first question? now it's large and impersonal and you never meet the coffee growers. That wasn't true at the beginning of the fair trade coffee movement. There used to be pilgrimages to go meet the coffee growers at the other end of the supply chain that you've been buying that coffee from. Um, but fair trade coffee today is much more corporate. You find it everywhere, including your supermarket. It's just not what it used to be. Direct trade is more relational. So it's intentionally working together, maybe an NGO, maybe a church group, maybe a charity in the West, it's working more intentionally with a group of specific coffee growers that you do know and that you do have an opportunity to meet and that you do follow in terms of what their economic development and progress is like. Um, one thing that I know about coffee, whether it's fair trade or direct trade, is a compassionate impulse will only accomplish so much. What also happens to be true is the coffee has to be great. And if the coffee isn't great, then every charitable coffee, whether it's fair trade or direct trade, is doomed to failure, because ultimately the coffee does have to be delicious. I think that in cases where specific companies, specific faith groups have made a more direct relational connection to coffee growers using the direct trade model, I think there's more promise and more hope there, because you're actually thinking more holistically about what's going on with those individual human beings. Um, but there's always a temptation for all of those organizations to appear successful. And how do you appear successful? You get bigger, right? And you accomplish more. I think that if we work more intentionally with smaller groups, families, communities, then potentially there can be more good. But direct trade coffee relationships, they also happen in the for-profit sector, too. Have you heard of this Grand Rapids coffee shop? It's called Madcap. They have, rela they have relationships with coffee growers, but they're doing it for-profit. And they want to make sure they have the best possible beans and they fly them in to West Michigan regularly because they want to make sure that those coffee beans are the best. And so they do have, driven by business, they do have serious relationships with coffee growers because when everybody flourishes, everybody's successful and people in West Michigan get to get delicious coffee. How do we reconcile uh, the use of child labor and um, irresponsible growing with buying the coffee that we like to buy? Yeah. 
So I have a couple of responses to that. The first one is even with the FLO cert process, right, even with this independent certifying and monitoring agency that Fair Trade International operates, um, cases fall through the cracks. Right? So we've had individual investigative reporters. For example, there's a guy named Hal Weitzman who did a series of investigative reports where he sort of dropped in on Fair Trade Coffee. And he discovered that in some cases, child labor was being used. People weren't being paid the local minimum wage, even though the growers had promised to do so. And in some cases, yes, child labor was used. So in either case, we can never know for sure. But if you think about this case of Madcap Coffee, Madcap, because they're motivated by profit and they have a relationship with the coffee growers, Madcap really knows really, really well what's going on in that community, what the livelihood of the children are like, and they have a better sense. So I'll say this, in 2018, it's one of the best times to be alive in terms of knowing what's going on all the way up the supply chain, right? It used to be 30 years ago, child labor was used, there were sweatshops, conditions were unsafe, and we just didn't have any way in the West to know. But today, because of technology, smartphones, that we have enough affluence now that we can devote resources to investigative reporting and monitoring and compliance. You can get more information today than you ever could have gotten in the past. So I can't, I can't absolve you of all the guilt you might feel regardless <laughs> of which coffee you buy. What I can say is, the more relational the coffee growing is, the better the sense you have that people are being treated with dignity and with respect. And we have to, Jeanette Walls, who she wrote Glass Castle and half her courses. When she autographs books, she, the way that she signs it before she signs her name is that she writes, push and pray. And I think many times we have to just do that. We have to take an action rather than be paralyzed. We have to take an action because I don't know about you, I want to drink coffee tomorrow morning. But then we just have to pray that the Lord faithfully uses our resources as we do these things that we have to do. So, so be a caring consumer, but also be a savvy, savvy consumer as well. Okay. Thank you. Next up. Uh, we'll go here and then we'll come back to you. Okay. Um, so you were mentioning uh, um, that the NGOs would be a better option for like donating money. Uh, I just wanted to ask, I mean, obviously there are more problems than just like fair trade coffee or coffee market in general. Yeah. Um, and you're, you're saying like the personal relations are important or probably the better way to do, donate money to make it more efficient. Uh, don't you think an NGO on a bigger stage um, would impact like, I don't know, uh, the law or like rules like more efficiently than like local or smaller, um, smaller NGOs? Yeah, so I think all of these initiatives, they have to be analyzed in a case by case. One thing, I, but I think one thing I've learned as an economist about business is every business has a size that's right for that business, right? So there are reasons why mom and pop shops can work really well. It's because they're the right size for that particular market. This is one of the things that we learned with the subprime mortgage debacle and the global financial crisis. We had some businesses that were too big for the market they were operating in. And if they had to incur more of the risks directly, then they would have remained smaller. So this question of fair trade copy versus NGOs versus other ways you can be of service to the poor, I think that the simplest way to be of service to the global poor is buy stuff from the poor. But buy it because it's really good stuff. Right, if somebody else is working hard to make a living and they deliver something in the global marketplace that's really, really good, you should celebrate that and you should buy it. When it comes to paying extra for coffee, which essentially is this charitable tip that you're passing along when you pay for the extra coffee, the data are pretty clear that most of what you pay in your country for fair certified fair trade coffee actually stays in your own country. It doesn't make it out. So it goes to equal exchange, it goes to your local coffee shop, it doesn't make it out. Um, when it comes to the case of NGOs and not-for-profits, some NGOs, they are very skillful at making a difference in individual human lives. No, no NGO, no not-for-profit is perfect. But I think that some, especially if they make available what their financial statements look like, get a much better sense of, of their total operating budget. How much is going to mission versus how much is going to overhead. 
So all of these things have to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. And when it comes to doing something like alleviating poverty in another country, some initiatives can be conducted at a very small scale, others can be accomplished at perhaps a larger scale. Yeah, I was just wondering, are there any other incentives for suppliers to actually purchase free trade coffee? Um, I'm just um, it's John, right? Yes, it's John. But I imagine when the market price falls under that price floor uh, set by free trade, that it just ends up hurting those farmers more. Is that the case, or? Yeah, so it's really helpful to think here what it looks like if you're a coffee grower and you're operating on a small scale, you maybe don't have all the financial capital you need at the beginning of the growing season. It's helpful to think about what does it look like for that grower. Um, there's actually a book that's a fictional book, but it's written by an economist at the University of San Francisco. His name is Bruce Wyden. And it's a novel, but it's called, it's about fair trade coffee. And the title of the novel is The Taste of Many Mountains. And you should check it out because it's great. And it's fictionalized, but it's based on actual field studies that Bruce Wyatt did with his grad students in Latin America. And he sits down and visits with families. He and his grad students, and they say, so why are you doing this? It's really expensive to join the network. Why are you doing it since most years it doesn't pay off for you anyway? And what you learn from that book is that individual small coffee growers feel like they have a lot of risk at the end of the growing season. Is their crop going to be there? And if it is there, how much are they going to be able to sell it for? And so in many ways, when families enter the fair trade network, they perceive what they're doing is buying insurance against either a very low price at the end of the growing season or a crop that's destroyed for them. But like lots of forms of insurance, this is one that over time doesn't seem to be paying off on average. But again, it's really hard to get a sense of, look, if if I don't buy medical insurance for myself in the United States in one year, or I get to vision in my pants, I know I'm going to be taken care of. Friends, family, hospitals, emergency rooms, I know, I know I'm going to be taken care of. If you're a poor coffee grower living a fragile existence, and it's difficult to make plans because you don't know how things are going to be at the end of that growing season, I totally understand why this looks like an attractive model, but it's one that doesn't seem to be paying off over the long Okay, so yeah. I think probably yell. Yeah, just do it okay. next time. Yeah. Uh, so you talked about the costs of the certification um, and then the maintenance of the certification over right. time and the inefficiencies. Is there data around where the benefits accrue on the uh, fees? You know, are they, you talked about overhead and results. Does yeah. the overhead justify the results and where does the overhead, who does it benefit? Yeah, so again, there are lots of, there are lots of studies now. And again, this whole nine study that I mentioned is one of the better ones. Because again, natural experiment. These people joined the Fair Trade Coffee Network, these didn't, they're local neighbors, and after 10 years, the people who had joined Fair Trade Coffee were actually worse off, because even though their incomes were higher, they weren't able to recoup all of those fees. Yeah, so that overhead was really, really costly for them. Um, there's something else I was gonna say there. Oh, it's also interesting to think about how Fair Trade operates on the supply side, not with a grower, but with organizations like Fair Trade, U, Fair Trade USA, Every time you buy a pound of certified coffee, Fairtrade USA gets 10 cents for that license. Right, so Fairtrade International, most of its budget every year comes from selling equal exchange and other Fairtrade coffee importers and roasters, the use of that label because it's 10 cents per pound. So it's a little like paying for that iridescent logo that shows that it's certified Major League Baseball merchandise or certified <laughs> NCAA merchandise. This is certified Fairtrade coffee merchandise. And the revenue stream there is really large for Fair Trade USA and Fair Trade International. Yeah, 10, 10 cents per, per pound. I think we have time for one more question. Okay, we'll, we'll go over here. Um, I was just wondering how, like, if energy drinks and like uh, other caffeine drinks have affected not only Fair Trade but like the coffee market in general, because I haven't really given you advice. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And I covered this in my short book. Um, at the same time that the coffee supply has been growing because of entry into the coffee market live by nations like Vietnam, at the same time, depending on which nation we're talking about and which demographic we're talking about, there's been a decrease 
in the demand for coffee because some, pe some people who used to drink lots of coffee have substituted to other soft drinks, energy drinks, etc. And when I was a kid in Western Pennsylvania, people drank coffee. In fact, Western Pennsylvania, coal miners, steel workers, the data suggested that they were some of the heaviest coffee drinkers in the United States. But in 2018, coffee consumption isn't what it used to be, where that was the picking up that everybody used. And excellent question. Actually, I thought uh, we could end on a question that's been on my mind, it's probably on everyone else's mind. Uh, how have your conversations with Nancy gone? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, you know, initially, there were some things that really used to bug me in church. And one of them was, our pastor would give the most convicting sermon ever about, you need to do something today to make a difference in the life of somebody who's dissipated. And there was one day that he stood up there in the pulpit and he said, buy the fair trade coffee after the, after the service today. All the money goes to charity. <laughs> That's just not, some goes to equal experience, some goes to Fair Trade International for the license, some goes to people who want the supply chain, it doesn't all go to charity. But then, as an economist, I started to be, I think, more forgiving of equal exchange and Fair Trade International because, let's face it, everybody along that supply chain, they're just trying to do what everybody else does, make a profit, earn a living, feel like they're doing something worthwhile and trying to get persuade other people that that's worthwhile also. So I'm not as cynical as I used to be, and I don't get as upset as I used to be, and part of it was reading this huge marketing literature, right, about just how price sensitive our fair trade coffee consumers relative to other coffee consumers, finding out those kinds of things, that was just really illuminating to me. So I'm not, I'm not as bothered as I used to be when people say things that just aren't true about the, uh, <laughs> the coffee market. So I guess the answer to the Nancy question is, when asked, I will tell what the data suggests. But otherwise, I'm not looking around to try to change minds actively. Hey, I see you're drinking your drink coffee. Let me make you feel more guilty about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. very much for that uh, uh, really illuminating talk which uh, certainly draw, draws attention to looking at uh, the larger picture that's attached to this type of question you know, rather than yeah, individual cases I think the uh, lecture made that very clear indeed um, that's it for tonight but you know, James Bond always returns <laughs> and we, uh, we do have the uh, the privilege of uh, having Senator Graham with us in a, a few weeks' time. I hope to see more of you there. Do fill out the questionnaires that are in front of you. It's very important that we can show that these talks are as well supported as they are. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank Dr. Connors has it. Um, there's like a little notebook, and you just write your name in it. Did you swipe in? Yeah. Uh, I think I can give Dr. Connors a copy of that. There's that. There's that. Yeah, David was coming I can send you the schedule. They weren't going to do it tonight. So you know when we are going to do it. Yeah. 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 I think I think they're like they keep fast and like Dr. Connor is staying there tonight. That's that's where the uh, all the courts of the people need to be. And they all want to come around. I don't blame them. Yeah. Alright, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. I thought that was really interesting. Oh, someone gave us. Thank you. Thank you.
Don't knock over the machine. Thank you. 